We need to talk. There's been a lot of positive talk about Apple's M1 chipsets lately. Have you got the new M1 MacBook Pro yet? Because I've tested it out, it's as fast as promised, battery life is incredible. Any chance you know anybody that can buy the $5,000 maxed out 16 inch MacBook Pro that I bought a month ago? Because that's how good the M1 Max are. And look, they've absolutely surprised me, a bit of a skeptic even, with their battery life and their performance. But I did two videos in my real world test series, I'll link those below if you want to check that out. Here, I think we need to talk about the bigger picture of what I think is happening. And it starts with another company that begins with A, ARM. First though, MediaTek, one of the largest ARM chipset producers in the world, with their ARM chipsets in products that you probably already own, if we're honest, offered to help me make this video. And so, with that said, let's talk about what ARM is and why it feels like a bunch of companies are starting to make their chipsets. Okay, let's first start off with who ARM is, because it can get a little confusing. There's ARM the company, and there's ARM the processors, which we'll get to shortly. The beginnings of ARM the company, though, start with another company founded back in 1983 in Cambridge, England, called Acorn Computers. Now, at some time in the mid-80s, a team within that company was charged with finding a suitable processor for their next generation of computer. They went out looking, but after a while, they decided they couldn't find a processor that fit the specs that they needed. So, over an 18-month period, they ended up designing their own. Fast forward to 1990, when Acorn Computers wasn't really doing well financially as a computer manufacturer, they spun out their processor designs into a new company called Advanced Risk Machines Limited. With Apple and VLSI technology as partners in the joint venture, Apple used the new chipset in the Newton, by the way. Then, in 1998, the company shortened its name to ARM Limited. Now, ARM doesn't actually make chipsets. They don't even have manufacturing facilities. Instead, they simply own the design of the chips and other related intellectual property, and they license that out to other manufacturers, like, say, MediaTek, for example. But also, Apple, Samsung, High Silicon, which is Huawei, Qualcomm, Amazon, Microsoft, you get the point. So that brings us to the next set of questions we need to answer, which is, what is an ARM processor exactly? What makes it different? And again, why is everybody seemingly jumping on board all of a sudden? We have two major architectures used in chipsets today. We have ARM, and then we have x86, which is mainly used by Intel and a little bit by AMD. The biggest difference between x86 and ARM are the way they give instruction sets, or it's the way that the program gives instructions to the chipset at the lowest level. The R in ARM stands for RISC, which in turn stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computer. And while it is kind of a larger philosophy about computing in general, suffice it to say in this video that it means that ARM processors require a much smaller instruction set compared to x86, which can be given a much more complex instruction set and then use its own methods to parse everything out and figure out how to go through it all. Think of it like someone giving you a to-do list. ARM would give you one task at a time and you would do it and come back to get the next one task and then do that and so on. Whereas x86 would give you all of the tasks at once and you will go about figuring out how to get them all done. Now these two different ways of handling instructions have their pros and their cons. On the one hand, x86 and their more complex instruction set can handle more complex workloads like that to-do list and figure out the best way to handle all of the tasks at once. And it's why you still see it being used at the highest end of computers for the most part right now. On the other hand, ARM is a lot more power efficient as it doesn't have to use energy figuring out what to do with the to-do list, what order to do the tasks in, etc. It just gets instructions, gets it done with the energy needed, and comes back for the next one. This also means less heat is produced, which is why ARM is the entire mobile phone industry, a use case that needs better battery life and obviously can't have a fan in it. With Intel creating more efficient chipsets lately and ARM manufacturers creating more and more powerful ones, both architectures which normally kind of lived in their own world are now competing for a middle ground. But there's one more big advantage to ARM processors, and that's that ARM can actually license out the architecture to manufacturers who can then create their own custom cores and 
tailor them specifically to the use cases that they need. MediaTek, for example, uses this to create chipsets that are purpose-built for a ton of custom use cases, while also keeping the cost down for manufacturers and ultimately for consumers as well. Devices like this two-in-one Chromebook uses MediaTek's tablet-optimized MT8183 chipset, which has an eight-core ARM-based CPU paired with an ARM-based GPU, and has been customized for multimedia playback, web browsing, and other things you do on a tablet slash Chromebook. And even though it's a Chromebook with a touchscreen that also comes included with a detachable keyboard, you can find it for under $250 brand new. I'll leave links below for anyone who's curious about that. But also at the extremes of computing, we have the world's smallest computer created by the University of Michigan and is based on an ARM Cortex M0 Plus processor and is smaller than a grain of rice. On the other end, the world's most powerful supercomputer as of April 2020 on the top 500, which is a list of the 500 most powerful computers updated twice a year, is the Japanese Fugaku, which is also based on the ARM architecture. It hit 442 petaflops. That's 442 quadrillion floating point operations per second, three times more than the next fastest computer on the list. On top of that, it's also the 10th most power efficient on that list by performance per watt. Now, this is the first time that an ARM processor has ever taken the top spot on that list, but it just goes to show what a manufacturer can do when they're able to customize the architecture for a very specific task. In this case, trying to get the highest benchmark score they could that was used for the ranking. Apple does this to the ARM architecture in their M1s to be more optimized at running Mac OS, their own OS on Mac computers, their own computers, and companies like MediaTek use ARM chipsets that they customize and produce specifically for different industries like IoT and smart home. You know, a lot of the Amazon Echo devices that you have have their chipsets in them. Mobile phones like the LG Velvet here in the US. Bluetooth speakers like this one from JBL. Even Chromebooks like we mentioned earlier. And the list of things they make work better by using customized ARM chipsets specific to their industry and use case goes on and on. So the thing with either processor is that because they have different instruction sets, the ones made for one will not work on the other instruction set. So apps made for the vast majority of x86 programs like Windows and Mac need to be reconfigured to then work on ARM processors. And things on iOS and Android that are on ARM processors would need to be redone to work on Windows or Mac, for example. Hello. Now, in the meantime, in the computer world where the vast majority of processors are x86, companies like Microsoft and Apple have created programs that convert x86 code into code that the ARM processors can understand. And that works, but it's not optimal. Even Apple lists Rosetta 2, their program meant to do this exact thing as being, quote, meant to ease the transition to Apple Silicon, giving you time to create a universal binary for your app. It is not a substitute for creating a native version of your app, end quote. And I even did tests to show how much of a difference a native app has over a translated one, and spoiler, it's a lot. So for now, this is a bit of a downside for ARM chipsets that are being used in the traditionally x86 space like Mac and PC. But as more and more manufacturers use ARM chipsets in their devices, and then more developers start to make their programs optimized for ARM chipsets, as there are more and more of those devices, it'll become less and less of an issue. Now, even though Intel is making more efficient chipsets, it feels like to me that ARM is moving up in performance faster than Intel is moving down in power consumption and power efficiency. And I, for one, am very curious to see how Intel and AMD boost their efforts to respond to all of this. But the bigger thing for manufacturers right now is the ability to customize those chipsets to their specific use cases and on top of the already better battery life and lower heat production. So manufacturers with the huge amount of resources it takes to create custom chipsets for their specific devices stand to benefit by getting more performance for those devices for those specific things that they need to do. And there you go. Another decoder episode. Let me know what you guys think of this video. Uh, the format it did a little bit different this time. Curious what you guys think. Always appreciate hearing from you guys. Um, also, let me know what you think of ARM chipsets and 
Intel and AMD and all the other fun, fun things that are happening in the chipset world. Always appreciate it. If you like this video, though, please subscribe or share. It's greatly appreciated. Also, check out the rest of the channel. If you like what you see there, please subscribe and ding the bell next to it. Subscribe so you get notified when I do new videos. As always, though, regardless, thanks for watching.